Hey everybody, it's Mark Schultz here, and we are coming back again for our uh, broadcast, webinar broadcast on blockchain. Um, it's going to be really an exciting um, opportunity for us to be able to uh, share with you the uh, information that you wanted to see um, from the blockchain broadcast that we did the first few times around. And uh, it's going to be a great event, and um, you're not going to want to miss it. We're going to talk about blockchain again. We're going to talk about some use cases uh, that exist out there. And um, we are going to have our special guests back with us again. Um, do not miss this. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you this morning? Hey, Mark. Good morning. Actually, it's evening where you are. Um, it's uh, morning where I am in Seattle, and it's evening where you are. Um, hope everything's going well. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Good morning. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, uh, gentlemen, let's just quickly reintroduce ourselves in case people um, don't remember or know who you are. Um, LV, could you tell us who you are and what you do at Real Variable? Right. So, thanks, Mark, for having us again here. Um, my name is LV. I am the co founder and uh, chief technology officer at Real Variable. We have been working on creating uh, multi party collaboration solutions, so using blockchain as the backbone. And uh, we have been uh, doing this for the last three and a half years, and uh, uh, we have been one of the pioneers in terms of uh, making uh, some of the uh, multi-party collaboration. Perfect, perfect. And our uh, our next guest is Kieran. Kieran, um, how are you this morning, Kieran? You doing well? Uh, hi, Mark. Good morning, uh, and uh, very warm welcome to the participants uh, across the world. Uh, really appreciate uh, and we are honored and humbled to be here on the fourth webinar, which is a bonus webinar. So yeah. my name is Kiran Prakash. Uh, I am uh, AVP at uh, Real Variable. Uh, I take care of the strategic uh, new business account acquisitions across various verticals. And uh, I myself come with uh, uh, deep knowledge of the aviation industry, having worked uh, in the aviation sector for the past uh, five to six years. Right. So what we have is we have two very significant experts in the blockchain. So let's jump right in, everybody. Um, I know you're all very interested in the subject of blockchain. Aviation has been something for those of you that are watching that's very exciting. And we're going to get right into it. Before I do that, I just want to say, can you please help us by sharing this stream so that um, people can see it uh, out there um, uh, and all the different platforms that we're broadcasting on? We're actually pro broadcasting on about seven or eight different platforms right now, um, this final uh, blockchain webinar. And remember that we're going to be taking questions, your questions live. We had some really lively discussions um, over the last uh, few weeks on blockchain. So um, first thing is, is that if you're out there watching, just put a comment in the box and tell us where you are and where you're watching from. We'd love to know who you are and where you're watching from. And if you have questions, just start putting in them in the box. Um, looks like we're already getting people, you know, joining us from uh, different locations. Um, doesn't say from where, but there's a uh, gentleman pronounce that name for me. It's Neil Mani Singh Gangwar. Okay, excellent. All right. I'm, I'm not very good sometimes at international names. So if you guys are out there watching, um, I would love for you to just say hi and tell us where you're coming to us from. We'll give you a shout out during this. Um, so, hey, uh, let's start out with this, gentlemen. I want to sort of reset this uh, broadcast and go back just a little bit. And um, uh, LV, I want to start out by saying, LV, tell me what is the importance of blockchain to aviation right now? Why is it important right now? <clears throat> so, uh, as we have seen, Mark, in the last uh, two or three sessions, right? So, blockchain is the way that you know we see the application of blockchain is in the multi-party collaboration. And uh, as part of a multi-party collaboration, uh, the industry is now growing beyond uh, exchanging the information or seeking the information beyond the tier one supplier and tier one customers. So, as the, ind the industry is evolving and you know as it is progressing in terms of you know working with different tiers of suppliers and customers, there is a unique opportunity and a unique need to be able to exchange the information in a trusted way. So, the information is not going in a hops from tier two to tier one to the OEM or uh, you know the supplier one to supplier two to the MRO operator. Uh, it has to be shared with uh, the entire ecosystem you know which is involved. Uh, that is where you know we see uh, the uh, aviation industry you know getting benefit out of it, and there are uh, wonderful uh, use cases uh, that are there, uh, which are forming part of the supply chain, and then also getting beyond that uh, in the aviation industry. 
Okay, perfect. So in the past, we've talked about the fact that it provides us easier ability to be able to implement multi-party collaboration. We've, we've talked about it being able to give us um, permanent records, immutable records that exist out there. You know, we've talked about uh, the platforms that you've built and how it's easier to onboard and share those with people across many places. Those are all really important aspects, okay? Now, um, before I jump to the second half of this question, I wanna keep engaging with people so people know that we're paying attention to them. Um, one of our platforms I can't put up on screen, but I have Jim Fitzgerald from the US. Jim, wanna welcome you onto the platform or onto the broadcast today, thank you. Um, we have some other people, we have people joining from, we have uh, Khalifa joining us from the UAE, and uh, we have uh, 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 Nilmini, Nilmini from the, the UK, excellent. Very glad to see you on board with us. Um, we have more difficult names for me, gentlemen. Pronounce that name for me. That's Gaurav Kumar. There you go, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I got Simon Barker, who is a very uh, frequent watcher. He has a big conference coming up in uh, November, I think it is in Toulouse. You guys need to check that out. And um, really glad to have all of you guys uh, on board with us watching today. <clears throat> Let me go to the second half of this question, all right? So blockchain, all right? Um, the other thing people have asked of us a little bit about is uh, uh, when we're using blockchain now out there, why is blockchain better? Well, I'm not gonna say better. What advantages does blockchain, using blockchain give us over say using um, just databases uh, in aviation today? LV. Uh, sure, so not necessarily from an aviation perspective, I would like, I, you know, I would answer from a, a generic perspective, right? Uh, the industry has grown, uh, Mark, in terms of you know having uh, the information generating from the source and consuming at the destination, which means that the business rule has to be written at the source. The business rule has to be written at the destination in terms of you know storing this information. Now there could be changes that happens at the source. There could be changes that happens at the destination, and uh, so, uh, when this happens, uh, you know the actual information set uh, when it is transposed, you know it loses its it loses its uh, you know character or you know it loses uh, you know the importance or you know it, it gets into errors so but when it comes to blockchain right so the entire network will have a reference to the same information set and whatever is uh, you know visible to them in terms of you know the controls uh, what needs to be visible to you know each party and then the business rules also need to be written and can be written on the blockchain layer itself, which means the source and destination have the same business rule rather than you know, having an individual copy of the business on both sides. While that is one process, uh, while that is one advantage, the second advantage is that you, know, you can easily create workflows uh, between multiple parties. Uh, so that becomes a true multi-party collaboration. So aviation, automotive, discrete manufacturing, consumer electronics, all of these sectors have this need today in terms of, you know, getting into multi-party collaboration and, you know, extended workflows beyond enterprise. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I, I see that there's going to be a tremendous amount of uh, advantages when it gives us this core baseline of capability that we can build on. Hey, listen, um, normally I wouldn't take a question like this until the end, but I, somebody just asked a question that I want to kick it off with a question so that people ask questions. I want people to ask questions. I really want you to ask questions. This one's a little bit off topic a little bit, but I thought it was very intriguing. And the question is, is that do you think we'll see aircraft manufacturers creating their own cryptocurrency to facilitate payments within our own system? That's really an interesting you know, idea. If we have blockchain being used to provide multi-party collaboration and records and you know flow of warranty and parts do you think we could see a separate cryptocurrency that was being used to to as, as payment forms quite possible quite possible if there is an application for that and uh, you know if that is something you know which um, uh, the settlement happens uh, you know immediately based on the smart contracts execution so the, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful thought actually yeah, that's a that's a really interesting idea. Okay, so listen, keep submitting your questions. I'm going to take them. I won't forget about you, but we're going to jump into um, a one more question I wanted to have for Kieran before we went on. Another big hot topic that came up last week was digital twins. And so, Kieran, just give us a quick refresher on what a digital twin is and how it fits into this, and then we're going to jump into some of the use cases. So, Kieran, talk to us a little bit about digital twins and what it really is and what's the value of that in blockchain. Uh, yes, Mark, sure. So digital twin basically is a digital uh, equivalent of a physical object. And uh, what we mean by digital twin is also to track the entire journey of a part or a component or any object 
right from the day it was uh, manufactured, the day it was put into service, and the entire life cycle. So when we say digital twin, it covers all these in, in a very broad sense. So it is not just uh, an object, but also the journey of the object through its lifetime. The reason why digital twin is a very important concept and is gaining traction across industries is because if it has uh, the time has come for uh, you know the OEMs, the large manufacturers to track each and every part or track each and every high value component at an individual level. So that is basically your serialization of the components or serialization of the you know high value assets, and uh, you know uh, this also helps the industry this also helps the operators and the mros because they will have all the information which is necessary for them to uh, use this uh, object or use this part or a component in aviation context uh, in a proper way uh, ensuring that all the safety related checks and compliances has been maintained and it also gives a backfeed to the oem stating that okay this part has been used for so and so and such a long time and these parts had these, these 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 difficulties or incidents or issues or you know uh, snags so that can so the oems can also take this as a uh, continuous improvement or a feedback for them to actually you know fine tune their manufacturing process so it not only helps the oems but it also helps the operators mros and also the regulatory agencies to have this kind of information uh, you know information visibility and when you bring blockchain into the context it becomes a kind of immutable record. So immutable record meaning it cannot be tampered with. Nobody can go and change its history or nobody can go and tamper with its existing uh, uh, information set. So this brings in the trust in the ecosystem. So digital twin can very well stand on its own without blockchain. But with blockchain, it, it, uh, it brings the trust and also the immutability into the picture. So when we bring both of them together, it gives us, uh, you know, even greater capability. Yeah, I think we had some good um, conversation last week about uh, digital twins and records and how that can help us build a, a historical model, uh, an immutable, unchangeable model, you know, and by putting blockchain into there, um, it makes it, you know, all those things that LV talked about, it makes it more, you know, multi-party collaboration. It's uh, shared on the the distributed you know, infrastructure and all those different things, all those values. So I think we have a, a great foundation. So listen, now that we've talked a little bit about sort of just the basics of blockchain and, and for those of you watching, if you're jumping into the middle of this, maybe you haven't seen the first three um, you know, webinars, um, they are accessible on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you just do a search on the internet for digital aircraft, sorry, hashtag digital aircraft, you will find our YouTube channel and uh, on that YouTube channel, our previous uh, webinars are there and you can uh, watch them and you can get caught up on some of the great dialogue that we've had about uh, uh, blockchain you know, previously. So I'm gonna cut it a little bit short on the discussions of the technical aspects of blockchain because if you wanna get caught up on that, you can go back and watch that on our, our YouTube channel. Um, quickly, before we go on, I just wanna call out a few more people. We have Paulo you know, joining us. Um, uh, looks like Paulo's in Brazil. I usually got a lot of people watching from Brazil. Welcome, you know, from Brazil. It's great to see everybody from all around the world. Hey guys, isn't it fun how we can connect with people all around the world today, you know, in a, in a platform like this? It's just amazing. I mean, I, I really like connecting with people. I'm in Seattle, Washington. You guys are in India. We have people in the UAE in, in Malaysia, in the US, in Brazil, and in in all over the place. Um, on our other platform, we have um, we have Rajesh coming from uh, Malaysia and Vipin coming from uh, India. So we have a lot of people coming from everywhere. Welcome. I'm really glad to have you. Keep asking your questions and we'll bring those up. Karen, we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk a little bit about use cases because one of the things that people really wanted to know about last week were, hey, let's talk about the business problems being solved and how they're being solved and what's the real value in doing that. So what we decided to do for the next uh, you know, 30 minutes or so was to have conversations about um, use cases, about uh, business problems and how they're being solved, all right? So Kieran, where would you like to start? How would you like to start in that conversation today? So Mark, Digital Twin is something which uh, uh, I already gave a brief about. So you know, uh, we discussed in detail about what Digital Twin was and how it really benefits the industry You know, with respect to aircraft tracking, with respect to component tracking and how all this information becomes a very rich and uh, valuable data to different parties. 
so today we will be focusing on the second major use case that is on the warranty management mark so uh, uh, as uh, as you can see uh, warranty management is a very important topic and which kind of you know just uh, uh, enough importance or enough attention is not paid to this topic so we have picked up this particular topic because we really see a huge value uh, or huge huge value proposition in what we are building as far as uh solutions are concerned on warranty management so uh, this wa so warranty is uh, you know if i go with the literal definition of warranty warranty is basically a, a kind of uh, uh commitment or a kind of you know assurance which a party gives to its customer that you know this product will be working for so and so flight hours so and so flight cycles or you know for certain period of time and if there is any failure with respect to the product during the stipulated period of time then there is a there is a provision of creating claims now claims can be of different uh, different types it can be uh, it can be complete uh, value based claim or it can be a claim where repair is involved or it can be a claim where repair and replacement is involved so there are different types of claim uh, warranty and claims management concept so today what we would be like we, we would like to highlight is we would like to explain the viewers how warranty management uh, is really important from a oem standpoint from a operator standpoint and we have also tried to bring in uh, some interesting uh, interesting analogies or uh, you know equivalence with the automotive industry as well as far as pain points is concerned so let me get started with the very first pain point so the very first point is uh, 70% of aircraft and warranty part warranty agreements are today paper based so we are talking about huge bunches of you know uh, pages and pages of warranty agreement and this type of paper based agreement is a uh, lot of analysis needs to go into this and uh, the warranty administrators need to be you know need to have the entire warranty agreement uh, in their tips fingertips if they have to uh, if they have to uh, understand what are the various uh, conditions what are the various operational conditions in which a claim could be raised so unless and until some people or a group of set of people have that kind of visibility it becomes very difficult to uh, manage and track warranties now we do understand that certain warranty conditions are supported and are uh, you know available in uh, erp systems namely sap and the other mro it systems as well but it is the operational conditions which is really not uh, present in those uh, systems so here, this here, what do you mean by operational conditions what is that what do you mean so when we say operational conditions uh, you know it it, it could be uh, how many uh, uh, what are the conditions under which uh, the part has failed you know it can be a temperature based condition it can be uh, the number of uh, uh, rpm based conditions that is for automotive industry and for aviation it could be with respect to flight hours flight cycle and also taking into consideration the temperature and the weather conditions which is all very you know uh, these are these are these some of these parameters are uh, uh changed based on the conditions based on the operating environment itself so not everything gets captured into systems today so this this information although it is available in the paper based document but doesn't really come back into the system as a part of, as a business rule yeah so what you're saying is it's difficult to incorporate all those things into the overall process and the considerations from a very basic starting point of it being electronic you know at the, is what you're saying yeah okay all right okay thank you yeah and uh, next pain point is mark uh, because the lot of information based in paper based documents so we have seen that one in four claims generally gets missed due to lack of understanding so from a operator standpoint uh, that is as high as 25% of claims you know which gets which kind of gets missed uh due to uh due to improper or uh, you know not full understanding or deep understanding of the paper based uh, warranty agreements sometimes it is understanding sometimes it is interpretation as well you know the way the people might interpret uh, you know certain condition to the other person interpreting the condition could vary absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah we we've, we've definitely found in aviation that when we're capturing like write ups and you know different things is that the more structured the environment is, the more valuable that data becomes. Is is it maybe like discrepancies on aircraft or different things like that? And so when you're providing, you know, an electronic environment to be able to capture that with more structured uh, environment, your ability to be able to manage that and interpret it better, you know, definitely is improved by having these kind of systems. Yeah, definitely exactly. they'll be. 
right then the next pain point is uh, you know pertains to the dollar value itself so in, in an average of 4 million dollars is claimable per aircraft especially in the initial years uh, when the aircraft is covered under uh, you know warranty so that is uh, uh, i think 3 uh, to 5 years of uh, full comprehensive warranty and i think the airframe components get covered for uh, as much as as long as 12 years so when the aircraft is new out of the stable and you know the airlines are using so there is an average of 4 million dollars depending upon the size of the aircraft whether it is a single aisle double aisle aircraft single deck double deck aircraft uh, it all depends on uh, the size and uh, you know uh, complexity of the aircraft structure itself so keeping that in mind an average of 4 million dollar is something which is claimable but which is not fully realized today and when you multiply this by the fleet size of let's say 50 100 then the number then the claim value becomes uh, the missed claim value becomes a much larger uh, uh, value proposition or uh, you know or missed claims rather it's good um kiran uh, we continue to get you know more watchers out there today i know there's a lot of you out there watching today thank you for being out there we um we have some people that have joined us from dallas texas that's great welcome shane and uh, ali from uh, oman uh just joined us uh welcome ali i've seen you on lots of our broadcasts in the past and you've asked questions and thank you for doing that if anybody has questions out there as we move forward be sure to put them into the comment boxes because we're going to continue to answer your questions today go ahead kiran yeah then uh coming to the pain points which the oems are facing so the very first pain point is uh, the traceability with respect to product warranty agreement again it ties back to the point number 1 because most of these paper agreements are paper based so the trace establishing traceability from oem to tier 1 tier 1 to tier 2 and tier 3 is something which is uh, not very easily established as far as product warranty agreements are concerned then the next pain point is with respect to the systems itself so you know when you talk about oem to supplier and the supplier tier 1 to tier 2 and so on uh, at least the supplier community uh, from oem uh we see that most of the systems are pretty much uh, disconnected as far as information exchange is concerned so there is a there is a limited amount of connectivity till tier 1 circle but that also is not fully uh, fully fully established uh, in the systems so most of the information generally uh, uh, is or information exchange happens through emails uh, through uh, pdfs getting exchanged vice versa so we see that the information itself is not fully uh, available in a digital format in a single system or in a single platform then the next uh, pain point is regarding the claim incidents itself so when you have systems which don't talk to each other and when you have paper based warranty agreements and as lv rightly pointed out everybody will have a different interpretation of the agreement clauses and terms and conditions itself so that really gives rise to claim litigation incidents and once it gets into claim litigation incidents then we are talking about additional cost time and efforts and uh, money to get those sorted and have uh, you know third party agencies uh, get onboarded onto this particular uh, uh, it litigation incident itself so all in all it it, it leads to more time and uh, efforts on all sides so these are some of the warranty related warranty related pain points which we could uh, identify with our extensive research for the aviation industry we i also want to bring in some perspective of what what would happen in the automotive sector as well so that you know uh, we can correlate both the industries as they are pretty much similar uh, you know to certain extents uh, uh, as far as uh, the output and the you know the finished product is concerned so when it comes to automotive sector some of the pain points which we have understood which is apart from the ones which is already listed here is uh, there is a situation in automotive industry where uh, claim uh, low value claims and uh, low value uh, low low number of high value uh, sorry high number of high claim values and lower claim value is something which uh, is a very critical pain point for them so you have large uh, huge volumes of claim but the value of claim is very low so generally what happens is this kind of claims kind of gets dropped or you know it kind of uh, uh, gets uh, written off because the time and effort to require to claim this low value uh, claim tickets itself is uh, more than the time which is required for you know the efforts required for claiming this is far more than the claim value itself 
so this is one of the pain point which we have seen in the automotive industry and uh, there is always there is also one more pain point which is uh, differentiator here is uh, the claim multiplier so you know the one claim coming to oem gets split up into multiple claims at the supplier side so which may also be the scenario in the aviation sector as well so these are the couple of uh, pain points which we have identified apart from the ones already listed as far as uh, automotive industry goes yeah so Kieran if i think about what you just said is is that you know anybody that has difficulty in administering small claims um if it was easier to administer those it, you know you're more likely to process them so in any um environment if we created an environment which made it easier to capture and to manage and to process large volumes of small claims um it would uh it would uh have significant value because it because otherwise you just wouldn't do it is what you're saying Absolutely, Mark. Yeah, You're right. Okay. All right. Well, very good. Well, these are some good, uh, some good points. So, what do we do about this? Yes. So, I have some more uh, statistics to share. Uh, you know, based on uh, uh, what we have done as far as the industry research is concerned for the aviation sector. So, what you see in the first figure is the, uh, the amount of claims which is paid per year uh, uh, based uh, for the airframe manufacturers, and the second figure, what you see is the claims which are paid by the jet engine manufacturers. now all this information we have sourced it from warrantyweek.com which is one of the leading uh, warranty related uh, magazines uh, uh, online digital magazine available uh, you know publicly and uh, we have relied on the secondary research and the information which is already collated by warranty week as far as these companies are concerned so if if i were to go a little bit deep on the amount of claims which is paid by this big oems large airframe manufacturers you can see that in 2019 almost uh, 1.8 uh, billion dollars worth of claims was paid so this is all in millions so if we extrapolate it becomes 1.8 billion dollars now if we were to look at the claim figure in 2018 so it would be somewhere close to 1.2 or 1.3 so there is clearly a 40 14% increase in jump as far as claims is concerned and if we were to see the constituents of the claim uh, we see uh, the blue shade is represented by boeing so that comes to around 300 uh, million dollars as per warranty week uh, the green one is the bombardier one which is uh, again uh, 200 to 300 and then we have the other ones uh, based on the uh, amount of claims which they have reportedly paid in their balance sheet so all this information warranty week has uh, collated by looking at the balance sheets and looking at the information which is publicly uh, publicly uh, you know uh, publicized by these companies itself so this is what we understood as far as uh, the airframe manufacturers are concerned and overall if you see over the last 5 years uh, the claim has been pretty much around 1 billion dollars per year so this is what the uh, industry has spent as far as the claims is concerned that is the airframe manufacturers Hey Kieran, um uh we have a a question that came in on one of the other platforms and I can't put it up on the screen but I'd like to read it. Is that okay? Sure. Um it comes from Rajesh and it says as part of the warranty management um what if the customer wants to return parts to the supplier? How does the traction um on blockchain uh help this? So if someone wants to return parts to the supplier how does using a blockchain platform like this help them do that so uh, so mark correct me if my understanding is correct when we say supplier it is the oem supplier correct i mean the tier 1 supplier well yeah they they, they said oem uh oem supplier supplier so they said correct okay. yes yes okay. so then uh, that that uh, that becomes very easy to track mark because uh, you know uh, in the next slide i will show how the entire forward movement of uh, parts and uh, sub components and assemblies can be you know uh, can be collated with this kind of solution so when you have that kind of information available it becomes very easily to backtrace the particular supplier serial number or a component uh, you know which has failed so uh, as a as a oem uh, as an oem or as an operator you know depending upon how much information the oem shares with the operator with respect to the part serial lot configuration and the entire configuration assembly and you know which part is coming from which supplier it becomes very easy for the operators or the mros who are the authorized repair agencies to see what part number or serial number has failed and because that information is 
available uh, uh, you know in the form of blockchain and the entire configuration history is also available also uh, giving the information of which supplier had supplied that part and which date was received uh, by the oem it becomes very easy to track this kind of uh, failures so uh, again it depends on the warranty condition itself so if it's a uh, foc repair then the part will just need to be sent back to the supplier who will replace it free of cost or if there is any claim which uh, will be raised wherein you know the mro will be doing the uh, maintenance activity and then a claim has to be raised even that can also be done because yeah, so all this information yeah so i i would think that uh, now that we have you know it digital and we have multi party collaboration the information is more broadly available you know that um it just makes the whole process easier and smoother than because we put it in this you know blockchain distributed kind of a platform that's kind of the bottom line right absolutely mark okay and there is one more point which uh, i wanted to highlight regarding the tier 3 and tier 4 suppliers so what we understand uh, from our discussion with various industry leaders is that tier 3 and tier 4 suppliers in aviation industry generally tend to be mom and pop shops you know with single operations and you know operating out of a single uh, facility uh, uh, in any part of the world so as a oem uh, it becomes very difficult to track these uh, tier 3 and tier 4 suppliers unless and until the higher suppliers actually give that information to the oem so as an oem as an operator if i were to have that kind of visibility to the nth level supplier then the information would be much more valuable and much more useful for the entire network yeah so i would i would imagine that what's happening then is that we're actually extending this out to everybody in the process and just making it much much easier now um including the smallest of contributors in the process so that's really uh, really very interesting that now we can collaborate you know much more broadly across the entire you know enterprise through the distribution of all that that's great absolutely man absolutely yeah. um uh can i move it yeah please yeah so the second figure i wanted to talk about is the jet engines uh, warranty claims in the last 5 years so if you see uh, these are the major uh, uh, major engine manufacturers uh, which has been analyzed by the warranty b so what you see here is uh, uh, in 2018 uh, the amount of warranty outgo was close to 2.1 billion dollars and uh, that has jumped from almost 1.5 billion dollars to 2 billion dollars so which is almost a, a 25% jump so which is a kind of significant uh, increase although 2019 there has been a decrease but we have to see how the 2020 figures turn out and uh, since there was a issue covid issue last year we have to see how the warranty has been uh, panning out in the last one year so i am interested to see the updated articles for the warrant from coming from the warranty week especially for the last year figures but even if you see uh, 2018 and 2019 figures we see that a uh, lot of warranty claims has gone from uh, ge again ge uh, you know the caveat for these reports is that some of these are really conglomerate so you have ge which doesn't report the warranty at the uh, at the business unit level so uh, the understanding is it may really not be ge aviation but it can be the entire ge business network uh, warranty outgo and same analogy goes to the utc which is now retheon group so uh, since these uh, since these large conglomerates report warranty at a organization uh, at a uh, you know at a at a organization level it becomes slightly difficult to identify and track the uh, individual warranty individual individual business unit warranty expenses but one point which we have understood from our discussion with various leaders is that there is a significant amount of revenue leakage irrespective of whatever numbers you see on this chart there is a significant amount of uh, leakage which happens because uh, the oems are not able to claim the warranty from tier 1 due to contentious uh, uh, you know uh, come uh, due to contentious uh, warranty claims or warranty terms which can be interpreted in different way by different parties and same is the go same goes with the entire uh, tier 1 and tier 2 supplier network as well okay well we've uh... we've identified the pain points we've identified that there's significant cost impact you know in the industry what's next kiran yeah so this is this is all what we wanted to show as far as the pain points and you know why warranty management is a critical uh, aspect for the entire industry now let us look at the solution itself you know what what we are really doing in this space 
So what you see here is basically a process flow which talks about how the part or how the material is actually moving from the tier two supplier to tier one, tier one to OEM, and finally to the operator or the MROs, whoever is uh, you know the end customer. Now, for the sake of simplicity, we have shown only till tier two, but in reality, this can go up to tier three, tier four, and tier five. You know, as long as deep as it can really you know uh, physically is. Uh, as as deep as it goes physically in the industry itself now we do understand that beyond tier 1 and tier 2 the uh, the organizations may not even have a erp system or may not even have a software system for that matter so for that purpose you know we have built some screens uh, which will actually be you know sufficient enough for them to do the basic supply chain related transaction with respect to ordering with respect to receiving with respect to delivery and also with respect to uh, entering warranty related information which is required to be captured as part of this process so what you see here is uh, the movement of material from tier 2 to tier 1 and tier 1 to oem so what you see here on the top is the forward movement of parts in the supply chain and what you see here is the backward movement. So let me first talk about the forward movement. So what happens is these transactions happen in your SAP system. Uh, so you have your regular supply chain related transactions between tier two to tier one uh, and tier one to OEM. So what information actually gets captured on the blockchain is basically the outbound delivery, the bill of material and the warranty information. And uh, same, same is the case on the tier one side. So you have outbound from one side and you have inbound to the other. So outbound and inbound are uh, the very common terms which SAP uses in its terminology. And then you have your bill of material. So bill of material in tier one will be a conglomerate or will be a, a, com a combination of several such tier two parts which comes in, you know, uh, through the regular, uh, regular uh, uh, supply chain process. And then there will be a warranty related information for both the parts uh, which gets attached to the uh, finished or sub assembly, uh, uh, you know, at the tier one supplier. So that would be called as an outbound warranty. And uh, what you see here as an inbound warranty would be the uh, warranty related information, which would be coming from the tier two suppliers. So this way at tier one, uh, which is kind of a sub assembly, we can take it as a sub assembly level. So we are not only capturing the outbound warranty, but we are also capturing the inbound warranty and the bill of material for the entire part or the serial number itself. So this bill of material can be uh, say uh, after sales bomb. So we are not, really looking at the engineering bomb, which will be more of a proprietary information for all the suppliers and that, and that will be IP related property for them. Hey, Karen, I have a quick question. Um, a question popped up on the screen here that I want to bring up in a second, but you know, I've spent a lot of time um, with airlines uh, and um, suppliers, and we've talked about um, the challenge of just the volumes of things going on. And many times the warranty leaders and the people involved in warranties are simply just overwhelmed by the information, okay? And um, Ali from Oman asked a really great question, um, said, would it be possible to have an alert pop up in case there's a warranty due, you know, um, without warranty team intervention? And I know your answer to that is gonna be yes, of course, but but I'd like you to answer, you know, why that makes it more feasible to do that in this kind of an environment than just answering with a yes. Tell me why is it easier to automate this process. See, now we have automated, we have we have uh, artificial intelligence, basically we have we have automated process automation and we have blockchain. Tell me why it's easier to capture this under those circumstances, okay? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Eldi, go ahead, yeah. Right, so uh, as, as uh, you know, Kiran has been uh, talking about, right? So what we are capturing is at every stage, we are capturing proof of delivery, we are capturing proof of part usage and we are capturing proof of warranty and entitlement condition. These are the three basic, um, uh, these are the three basic or, you know, fundamental, uh, uh, you know, information that is required to be able to establish whether their warranty claim can be enforced to the next level. So the way that, you know, the, the solution is panning out is if there is a warranty claim that comes from, you know, the end customer to OEM, and you know OEM administers that immediately. The debit nodes get created uh, across the entire network based upon you know these proof of delivery. So to to, to answer the question, yes, uh, but it is not just like a pop up. It actually goes through the entire process of you know administering and you know ensuring there is a proof of delivery, there is a proof of part usage, 
there is a warranty entitlement you know that exists you know for that particular part and then automatically creates the debit market. So, so basically, if I could capture that, then is it you're you're not just you know giving an alert. You're using the knowledge or the captured intelligence that's now contained within the system to do yes. some analysis of that to determine you know the appropriateness or the timing or any factors that you're capturing to be able to help the process to make those decisions faster, better, and more efficiently. Is really what kind of what you're saying, Ben. Yeah, good, Absolutely. excellent. All right, well, very good. Well, thanks for asking that question, Ali. That was really great. And um, anybody else that has questions, you know, please keep asking them. So, Kieran, um, you know, please proceed. I uh, I know we jumped in in the middle, but I, it's really important to answer people's questions as we go. Otherwise, they kind of get left out of context. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely, ma'am. No problem. So, so as LV pointed out, uh, we are we are building as the material or as the part is moving in the value chain. We are also building these uh, smart contracts on the blockchain side. So if you see this proof of delivery, establishing warranty conditions, and also the bomb related uh, parameters. So what you see here is the tier two part usage in tier one part. So this is basically what, how the bomb is getting created uh, into the, uh, on the blockchain side itself, you know, as the material or as the part is moving in the value chain. So whenever there is a failure which happens, uh, and also, uh, apart from uh, apart from the conditions, uh, warranty related information, which is already available as a part of the standard ERP or MRO systems, we will also be able to capture additional warranty conditions by directly, you know, programming them on the smart contracts. So smart contracts, you can assume that it is a kind of a business rule engine, wherein all those operational parameters, which we discuss in the pain point, you know, with respect to the weather conditions, with respect to flight cycle, flight hours, those are the things which can be additionally configured and additionally written into the smart contracts. So whenever this, uh, uh, whenever there is a failure which is reported or whenever there is a claim which gets triggered from the operator, these additional terms and conditions on the blockchain side with respect to smart contracts also gets validated. So whenever there is a removal, part removal, uh, these conditions, these smart contracts will get automatically executed and it will give the list of suggested options, uh, su suggested actions which can be taken. So in this case, what is happening is a debit node is created directly to the OEM. And if the failure was actually a tier one or a tier two failure, then we would have the corresponding debit nodes created in the value chain also. So this way the operator or the MRO can go ahead and do the repair from their side and the claim can be uh, triggered or the claim can be recovered from the actual supplier or the supplier who has supplied the faulty part or the part which was under warranty and now has failed. Go ahead, Kira. Yeah, so, so I hope the process was clear. So essentially what you see here is the uh, forward movement when, it's, when the part is actually being built and final product or a component or aircraft is assembled and delivered to the customer. And the trigger point is basically the warranty claim itself. So there is a removal and then this engine can actually decide and explain what the warranty related conditions are, what the smart contracts are, and it will go back and trigger the debit notes with respect to various parties. So this is essentially the solution which we are building and uh, we are currently co-innovating the solution with SAP and a lot of industry research and uh, analysis has gone behind this solution and uh, we are closely working with the SAP team to build this solution, which is right now in the advanced stages. So, so, um, this is so, so Kieran, let's uh, let, let's take it back to your to your pain points and LV back to the pain points again, guys. Help me help me just sort of you know capture that now. You've just walked us through a process flow, and you know, and I'm I'm sure some people followed it, and others, you know, maybe it was maybe it was more complex than what people you know um, uh, can comprehend in one setting. But but just quickly tell me um, is is that how does doing what you just described address the pain points. Just summarize it up for me, Kieran, or LV, just summarize it up for me, yeah. I'll, I'll do it. So I am the tier one, I'm the tier one supplier and uh, Mark, you and Kieran are the tier two suppliers who have supplied the components to me, okay? So I have received a claim from my OEM that, you know, there is a, there is a sub-assembly that you have supplied as a tier one, which has failed. So this is my $100 claim to you, right? So now I know that I have supplied this part. So I will I will give that hundred dollar claim to the OEM. 
But now this hundred dollar claim, some part of it I have to recover from my suppliers as well. You know, because they, because of they, they, I mean, because of your part, my part has failed. You know, and that has been established. Now, first of all, how do I know that you know whether that part has been supplied by Mark or whether that part is supplied by Kiran? I don't know. Right. So today, in today, so I have to make sure that you know I dig that information out. Then you know I have to make sure that you know I prove it to you that you know it is actually the part that is supplied by Kiran that has failed, right? And then you know I have to make sure that you know Kiran accepts it. And then I also have to prove that you know that is the part which is actually used in the failed part. So this is what that happens you know behind the scenes. So now that part you know which I have used in this assembly, uh, the warranty recovery on that part would be twenty dollars, right? But now, to to be able to you know get the twenty dollar claim, would I spend a hundred dollar effort? Right? I would not. Yeah. So so LV, I guess basically what you guys are telling me is is that because you now are making it easier to capture the information, okay, you're capturing better information about the terms and conditions and when warranties can be claimed or become applicable, and you're making it easier to create transactions. You're essentially making the whole process expedited and much easier to do, easier to keep track of, easier to execute, easier to to uh, uh, to transact. And the bottom line is, is that all these missing warranty claims that just sit there unresolved can now be better managed to the advantage of the OEM or to the person making the claims because it's being focused on and being a a automated process. And because you're building it on the blockchain and because you're making it in this distributed environment, it makes it easier to access, easier to collaborate, you know, immutable, so not so more of a permanent record. And so in the end, it sounds like we're addressing all the key elements, which would go back to capturing all that value that you had in your charts, Kieran. I mean, that's kind of what the, the bottom line is. If we could sum up the whole thing, right? Yes, and easier to prove. Fantastic. Yeah, right. Very good. Very good. That's good. Kieran, that was really, really, really very interesting. So what's next, Kieran? What's next in the discussion? So I would just like to show a brief uh, product, uh, you know, uh, okay. sneak peek. I would not say it's a demo. It's just a sneak peek of the product. So what you see here is a kind of a SaaS based application, you know, which can be easily configured and, you know, it can just run on a simple web and uh, internet. So this is a kind of a super user login or a admin dashboard, which uh, which I am showcasing right now. And uh, we have seen all these four components in the previous slide, that is warranty, bill of material, outbound and inbound. So we have seen all these components. So as an as a administrator, I will obviously have access to all the components and all the functions and modules. Uh, depending upon the user based uh, uh, role access, you know, a role based access control, uh, uh, whichever relevant information can be shown to the relevant business users or the system users uh, who will be using this blockchain application. Now, all the information what you see here will be actually pulled from the various underlying ERP or the MROID systems, depending upon what is the base system here. So let me start off by showing you a warranty uh, claim itself. So I would select one customer. I would select a claim name and I would select a serial number and hit submit. So when I when I when I click this information, what you see here is there are three sets of data parts. That is proof of part usage, which was one of the smart contracts uh, which we just spoke about. So you have the finished good information, bill of material, serial number information, the uh, the bomb type, and also the component information. So which vendor has supplied this part and when it was supplied. What you see here is the proof of delivery. So this is the proof of when the part was actually delivered. What is the order information? So PO is the purchase order number and uh, how many quantities were received, how many batch were received, uh, this information along with the outbound delivery. So outbound is the information which is going back uh, as a finished product to the higher assemblies. And the last bit of information, what you see is the proof of warranty itself. So Whenever there is a finished good going out of from the OEM side, there is a customer warranty. So you have a warranty condition which will be between the OEM and the operator or the MRO. Uh, and there will be one warranty which will be from OEM to the tier one supplier. So all this information gets very seamlessly integrated and seamlessly captured and aggregated in the right format for the warranty administrator to actually look at this information and make sense out of it.
this is what we wanted to show on the warranty details. Similarly, yeah, I... yes, yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Mark, you know, this is the dream of every warranty administrator. Okay, having this. Tell me, why. Of... <laughs> Tell me why I should be excited about this. Tell me. Yeah. Right. So uh, I, 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 I want the screen uh, to be presented. Okay. Yeah. Right. Today, right, you know, if I, I just queried based upon the customer and, you know, a serial number of the part, you know, where the warranty claim has uh, come in. So to be able to have this, this entire information, you know, what was the finished good, you know, what was the component that has failed, right? And, you know, what is the proof of delivery? What is the purchase order? uh you know that is uh, the outbound and you know what is the sale order that is the inbound right and then you know what is the proof of warranty you know whether the warranty condition existed or not you know having all these three in one single view at the level of purchase order and the sale order number at the level of batch number at the level of you know the number of quantities that are supplied and the number of quantities that are received right this is this is what you know this is what a warranty administrator would would labor to you know get the information you know for every claim Right. Yep. So, so the bottom line is you're saying that this information just isn't readily accessible and to be able to present it in a consolidated view um, is uh, just, you know, amazing. The back end behind this to be able to supply this is the real core of the infrastructure you're talking about. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, okay. To be able to pitch this information across the value chain. Yeah. Yep. What, you know, makes like Go it. Ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Alvi. <clears throat> Similarly, we have the other screens, you know, which will uh, other functions which will give the necessary information. Like, for example, I have picked up this uh, bill of material number for this particular material number. So, if I were to see the uh, level one assembly, uh, I can actually go ahead and see what are the components of this, uh, what is the which supplier supplied the component, and what was the name of the component. Uh, if I were to go dig deeper, so this is an engine component. If I were to see the L2 assembly. I can simply click on the L2 assembly and I can see what are the components coming out of the, uh, you know, the lower assemblies, which is gasket and piston and so on. So this way uh, we can go up to nth level assembly itself. So, you know, we have seen automotive bomb going up to 11, 11 levels deep. So similarly, uh, I'm sure the uh, aviation bomb will be much deeper. But having this kind of information in a single consolidated view, uh, in a single, in a single, uh, you know, in the single view, with all the assembly related information and the supplier related information and the proof of uh, delivery, proof of uh, receipt date, is something which would be a great value addition for the uh, uh, administrators. Great, good. So, um, hey, let's uh, let's take a recheck here and say that um, we we have just a few minutes left in a presentation today, and uh, I wanted to make sure that we continue to answer people's questions um, out there. So, if you have any questions, please submit your questions, and this will be kind of a, another call for questions before we you know begin to sort of wrap things up because there's only about uh, uh, five or so minutes left in the presentation. So, if you have questions, let's get them in there so that we can uh, follow up with you and make sure that you have the information that you you need. Um, about blockchain and specifically today about warranties. So, Kieran, back to you. Great. Thanks, Mark. So, similarly, we have outbound and inbound in the interest of time. Uh, we, I would just go back to the presentation and show the business benefits now, which is the most important part. So, uh, coming back to the business benefits, the very first uh, business benefits or a KRA of the solution is uh, we expect 8 to 10 percent increase warranty recovery. Uh, from OEM and tier one suppliers from their counterparts. Now the same analogy can also go with the operators claiming warranty from OEMs, but uh, we see uh, overall we see eight to ten percent increased warranty recovery, uh, which translate to millions of dollars depending upon how business how big the business operations is currently. Uh, second most important business benefit is the complex warranty contract conditions can be handled through smart contracts, which I just explained in the process flow slide as to how the operational related terms and conditions which generally resides in the paper based documents can actually be brought in as a business rules on the smart contracts on the blockchain layer which gets triggered every time there is a claim which is stray, uh, raised or every time whenever there is a removal part removal which happens from the aircraft then uh, because this entire process is automated and you know uh, this system will helps uh, create uh, automatic debit note recommendations so obviously this will lead to increased number of claims uh, for the operators 
to the OEM and for the OEM towards the tier one suppliers and so on and so forth. So this way the entire ecosystem benefits and the right party which is responsible for the warranty related uh, uh, claims is, is the one which actually pays for the particular claim instead of a wrong party ending up for the bearing the claim expenses. Uh, finally, what we see is reduce inventory carrying costs. So when you have the warranty related information as an OEM or as an operator, you know exactly when the part is failing or what conditions, under what conditions these parts are failing. So you can have your optimized inventory based on your warranty related uh, uh, warranty related uh, you know uh, inputs. So warranty can also backfeed and help uh, optimize your inventory depending upon how how frequently the part is failing or how less frequently the part is failing. Finally, blockchain brings in the trust uh, because of its nature of immutability. All the transactions which gets recorded on the blockchain is highly encrypted. So as an organization, uh, the stakeholders need not worry that this information might be available in the wrong hands or uh, to you know uh, parties which should not be having this information. So these are some of the highest level encryptions uh, apply, deployed in the world today. SHA-256, which even the quantum computers cannot break. So again, very, very secure and robust and safe system for information exchange between multi-parties. And finally, uh, this entire trust, uh, trust immutability, and uh, the, uh, the fact that all this information is available in a single view and each party sees the same information. Uh, claim litigation incidents, we can largely be reduced between various parties, which will in turn lead to a lot of time saved and a lot of cost saved in an otherwise scenario. So these are some of the very key uh, important business benefits uh, from the warranty management use case, Mark. Okay. Um, Karen, because I went out and asked for questions, we've had a whole bunch of questions come in. Okay. So <laughs> we, we, need to, uh, we need to jump to some of these questions. Let me start out with some simple ones first. Okay. Um, they come in on multiple platforms. So I have to look around at different screens at the different platforms here. But thank you for submitting these questions. The first one is, is that is the system real time or is it uh, or is it delayed? Near real time. Near real time. Explain what that means, LV. Uh, we will be probably allow for you know a five to ten minutes of uh, delay for the smart contracts to be executed. You know across the chain uh, from the proof of delivery, proof of party use, and then you know warranty entitlement condition. So from the time the event occurs, uh, in the probably you know five to ten minutes of the time, the entire chain would have you know the same information. Okay. That's why excellent. We excellent. All right. Um, so the next question I have here that's come in is, is that um, I'm going to abbreviate the question here, but the question basically says if this information is being available, made available to multi parties. Okay. Who owns the data, the information that exists in the system? It's the, uh, like we always say, right? It is a distributed governance model. So even in the private uh, blockchain networks, there are, there is a consortium that gets formed, let us say, among you know ten different group of companies, and uh, you know these ten different group of companies will have uh, you know specific guidelines in terms of you know how the information should be governed on this platform. So it's a decentralized governance, even in a uh, even in a restricted group of participants. Okay, so so I know that this challenge would exist everywhere. Once we start putting large amounts of information available out on a blockchain that's distributed and is um, and is decentralized is is that are there lots of questions that come up about data ownership and accessibility uh we see we see questions a lot about like you know who owns the intellectual property of this solution right you know because it's uh, somebody um, uh, somebody's brainchild right but we do not see much in much of the questions about you know the data because so the data is getting shared today in one form or another right uh, but then when we are exposing this data in a multi-party collaboration, the data governance has to be at a consortium level or at a, at a network level. But as Kiran has mentioned, and as I also, you know, vouch uh, in this, whatever data that is put out there is encrypted, right? So which means that, you know, people who even try to look at the data with today's uh, available technology, it is not so easy to be able to, you know, decipher that information. Okay, so you have you have security so that only the appropriate people can access it, and um, the ownership of the data then becomes a distributed um, accessibility. But the bottom line is, is that the bottom line is, is is that who is it clear on who ultimately owns the data? Then is it the provider of the data, or you know, the entire network owns the data. 
Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. All right. Okay. Here's a question that came up on uh, on the LinkedIn platform: Is is that how do you track flight hours of a specific component? Airlines shall log flown hours or automatically done. How is that incorporated into a process for an airline who's wanting to track hours? Okay. So uh, I'll take that question, Mark. Uh, so basically, the operational related information also has to be uh, you know fed back into the blockchain. So uh when we when we take the uh, operational parameters we will also need to see what are the flight cycle flight hours and depending upon what information is coming into the blockchain and the smart contract rules and the business rules which is configured so all these things can be handled and uh, uh, addressed with respect to the business rules itself so it depends on what the organizations really are looking at and what is basically the understanding between the oem and the operator so so today the agreements are interpreted in a different way by different uh, legal teams of uh, these uh, entities so when it comes to smart contracts and blockchain uh, uh, and business rules it will be one single interpretation so all these uh, anomalies can actually be uh, done away with when we talk about a uh, business rules uh, configured on a smart contracts and blockchain platform okay so i would say then oh go ahead abhi go ahead yeah i'll i'll like to just add one point so this is where the concept of uh, the digital journey of the physical product which otherwise you know we call it as a digital twin makes a lot of sense because you understand like you know when the part is you know uh, attached to a particular uh, you know plane or you know a, a flight uh, the, the aeroplane and then you know when it is uh, detached uh, you know from the aeroplane so you have that information and then you know you have the flight hours of the uh, you know plane itself so that way you will be able to you know easily get that information without having to worry about you know whether i get it from the flight bag whether i get it from you know something else or whether i get it from somewhere else okay well very good uh, francois thank you for answering that question you know i guess i'll add to that myself is that um you know between the integrations um and the uh the capturing of the uh the the terms and conditions and the smart contract pieces that you've talked about it sounds like that um it would be basically up to what the needs of the organization were you know in order to be able to track that great very good francois thank you for that question i appreciate it we have one last question that i'm going to take here which i thought was kind of interesting it's on the other platform that i can't put on the screen but if i could it's a long question but if i could sum up the question the question basically says is that how can i trust this automated data when you compare it against the decades of experience of people that are used to doing this using their intellectual knowledge who's going to take that hard question <laughs> right. so okay. let me let me try, let, let me try to attempt it and then you know kiran can augment uh, you know okay. this one right, right. Okay. So, um yeah before uh, you know before the uh, before the computers were invented there was a lot of intellectual people you know working in uh, business but then you know later there is a huge transformation that has come in and then you know over the last 30 40 50 years we have seen uh, the reliance in terms of you know how the information is stitched together you know in the available platform now the trust comes from the very 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 aspect of like you know uh, what the human eye is reading and then comparing and then you know drawing the conclusion out of it is what the system is doing you know as it is in its rule so uh, this is not artificial intelligence yet this is simply you know looking at information snippets merging those information snippets with one another and then you know creating one ledger uh, which is you know the single source of truth as a ledger uh, to all the parties that are involved so that is where you know we see uh, it will be able to overcome that hurdle and you know overcome that barrage of like you know uh, the intellectual work translating into an automated work and then you know how do you make sure that yeah. it is correct yeah so right. so what i see is is that you, i like what you said you said it's not artificial intelligence yet okay but what it is is it's a broader gathering of data consolidating it into a simply usable presentation which allows actionable information okay exactly Yeah exactly. so I mean so I I see this as as helping in the decision making process by giving valuable information in a consolidated manner from more sources that's what I see very good Karen it's a, it's getting time for us to wrap up um what would you like to do in the finalize of your presentation yeah so I will just take a couple of minutes and quickly run through the last set of uh, use cases it's just uh, single uh, bullet point information so 
uh, I will sum it up quickly. So the first, uh, the other use cases which could be possible is the real time asset valuation. So when you have the digital twins available, uh, information of the part, configuration, aircraft, the uh, real time asset valuation can also be very easily uh, calculated, which will be a boon for the lessors. And today what we see in the industry is the lessor consolidation is happening. So, uh, you know, the lessors uh, are becoming bigger and bigger and uh, more aircraft and more helicopters to be tracked. So this information becomes very useful for them to go and uh, do the, uh, you know, have the real time visibility of air aircraft and the evaluation itself. Then the next point is uh, interoperable, uh, interoperator stock availability, stock purchase, exchange sales. So because the information will be available on a single blockchain platform, uh, the operators can subscribe to it and operators can come onto it and they can uh, uh, they can uh, do away with their stocks, open up their inventory for the uh, parts which is not in use. So this way, the inventory also is uh, uh, optimized and uh, the parts which are non-moving parts can actually be sold or uh, exchanged for the other parts in the uh, ecosystem. Then a rotable pool inventory tagging is a very good uh, example of how blockchain can really be implemented uh, in the aviation industry. So you have parts, so you have components, you have rotables uh, with different flight cycle, flight parameters, and they are stored in a third party pool location managed by some other player. So when these parts keep moving between the pool and there is a part, new part going in and another part, a serviceable part coming out. So all this information kind of gets, uh, you know, tracked today, today in the form of paper based agreements and paper based PBH contracts. So these information can actually be brought into blockchain and smart contracts and this kind of uh, billing information can be directly triggered, uh, you know, by executing the smart contracts on blockchain. So this really helps the pool inventory operators and also the airlines, you know, uh, sourcing part from these pools. Then again, uh, another good example is the loan borrow tracking of uh, parts. So as I explained in the previous use case, uh, when this loans and borrow happen, uh, uh, happens between operators, you know, because of their uh, AOG requirements or other cases, uh, it becomes uh, uh, easier to track this kind of information and, you know, build the operators in the right place and uh, at the right uh, amount uh, through uh, third party, uh, you know, through, uh, through uh, independent systems like blockchain and both parties uh, would agree to the terms and conditions of the rules. And this way it becomes very easy to uh, track and also build the operators for the loan and borrow uh, tracking. This is one use case uh, which has uh, which has emerged out of the current uh, COVID-19 scenario. So what we think is uh, uh, having the COVID-19 uh, information, COVID-19 testing information and also the vaccine information can also be brought into blockchain platform. And this will uh, hopefully enable the cross-border traveler. And this information will be, you know, much more acceptable and much more uh, readily, you know, uh, uh, readily acceptable by the border control agencies, immigration authorities, because it is not coming from a single system or a single entity, but the information is actually collated and stored into the blockchain. So this brings in confidence and this brings in more uh, comfort to both the uh, governments, operators of airports and also the passengers themselves that, you know, the information what you are sharing or what you are saying that uh, it is there, it's actually true and it's uh, untampered information. Final use cases on the baggage tracking and, uh, you know, various other airport related uh, scenarios wherein blockchain and IoT can help uh, in baggage tracking, which is also quite a big problem today because baggage loss uh, leads to a lot of disagreement and disharmony between the customers and the airlines. And it becomes uh, uh, a big problem if there are any celebrities involved in that and it becomes a kind of a national news. So blockchain can help in this uh, particular uh, use case as well. So this is what I would like to uh, uh, discuss today on the various other applications of blockchain. Uh, we are uh, open to uh, do a free evaluation and applicability of blockchain in your ecosystem. And we can help identify the top three use cases as to what would be the right fit. And if there are any use cases which you think uh, is uh, also of interest and you know you want to uh, actually try it out that also can be developed uh, you know using our enterprise platform and uh, blockchain technology very good so with gentlemen, I, yeah, gentlemen you've done a you've done an excellent job of uh, of wrapping this up we've had we've had four weeks now of uh, of discussion on blockchain and and uh, you guys have been very faithful in doing that repeatedly thank you for doing that um, I think it's been very very informative <clears throat> let me just point out here again that if you want a copy of the presentation today 
Um, just go to blockchain.digitalaircraft.org and you'll be able to uh, put in your contact information. If you're on a platform where you didn't need to register, like if you're on YouTube or something like that, um, you can go here and you can uh, register and we'll send you a copy of the presentation. As well, uh, Kieran will follow up, follow up and reach out to people um, that are interested and uh, see if you would like to learn more about um, applications in blockchain. And uh, let's continue this conversation. Gentlemen, you have some really great information that you've put together. And I really appreciate such dedication to the industry. Um, guys, you know that my focus has been on recovery in aviation. And uh, I find that there's a lot of companies that have a lot of opportunities to grow and to recover in aviation. But there's also companies that are just growing um, because they're implementing good ideas and good technology at this time and when we need to be able to put things forward like this, all right? And so guys, you are, your company is doing a really great job of leveraging current day technology, applying it to current day business problems and helping people to be more profitable and more efficient. That's what I see that you guys are doing. LV and Kieran, thanks for the great knowledge. Um, I really appreciate all that you've done you know, for the industry and providing these kind of solutions. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, um, all the audience, uh, for uh, joining this uh, sessions and you know the series. Uh, we look forward. Uh, uh, what the Kiran has presented as the last slide, each one of them could be a potential webinar. So, very good, <laughs> very good, very good. Yeah, there's yeah. so many possible applications of blockchain. It really does make a really big difference. So, um, gentlemen, thank you. Um, I really appreciate it and appreciate you being here today. Karen, thank you for your knowledge and your dedication. I appreciate it. All right. Everybody, thank, thank you. you for watching today. And uh, we look forward to engaging with you into the future. Um, fair winds and following seas to all of you. And have a great day. Bye now. Bye-bye.